The corporate rationales for adding value is another one of the Johnson Scholes and Whittington elements of the P3 syllabus. As you can see, it is explicitly referred to on the syllabus. It has been asked twice uh, in December 08 where it was poorly answered. And this is the concentration of this particular presentation is dealing with that question. Uh, then, uh, almost in retaliation, it was asked in December 10 in question 1. Uh, so this time, uh, if students weren't prepared for the topic, it wasn't just a case that they could avoid it, as they did in December uh, 08. And performance in that question, as you will see on the next slide, what was quite poor. Uh, lastly, as you can see, this topic is part of a technical article that was written in response to the poor performance in December 08 and prior to the next time it was asked in December 10. So essentially there was very little excuse for it to be poorly answered in December 10 and it was. So that's the context for this particular topic and therefore it's one of those topics that really is a need to know and not nice to know. On this slide you can see an extract from the examiner's report from December 2010 which was the last time that this topic was asked. As you can see he was not terribly impressed by the performance. You'll notice from the first set of comments you know, that he is particularly perturbed about the possibility that students were question spotting. And you can see that he has made an explicit reference to the study guide. And so that's a really strong indication that he feels that this is unacceptable by students to perform in this way and therefore he really has a duty or a responsibility to revisit this topic. The second comment that you can see at the bottom of this slide reiterates that and if you see the last sentence, this appears to have been due to a lack of knowledge in this area of the syllabus. This then requires the examiner to go and revisit that topic, much the same way that an auditor uh, is required to revisit an area where there might have been problems on a previous audit. So even if the examiner doesn't want to ask this particular topic, he effectively has no choice. He has to revisit it, and that's something that we need to be very conscious of. Having hopefully convinced you of the importance of this topic, now would be a good opportunity to try and understand it. So the corporate rationales for adding value examine the notion that a corporate parent may actually add, or in some cases, destroy value of a child company, to use that expression, within its portfolio. Now mostly this examines the concept of a larger organization acquiring a smaller organization, but it also can, to a lesser extent, <coughs> address the issue of mergers, whereby the new merged entity might be made up of two companies, but those companies will not have been equal in size. Uh, so one of the companies um, would have been much larger, the other is smaller, therefore the new entity uh, is made up of, let's say, 70% of the old company and 30% of the other. So the management um, from the larger company might be still, to use the expression, calling the shots, and in doing that, they're not actually adding value as was intended in the new larger entity. They're causing more problems and then they're adding positive things. So the three different concepts or approaches um, that Johnson Scholes and Whittington discuss are the portfolio manager, the synergy manager, and the parental developer. And I suppose one of the simplest things to start with here is that you must ensure that you're adopting the right type of strategy. So for example, if the company that you're acquiring is a perfectly well-functioning company and they're engaging in a type of commercial activity that you don't really understand properly, well, then you're far better to just to be a portfolio manager. Uh, there's no point in trying to get involved or get stuck into a business where really you, you can't contribute much. So you're not really going to add value, again, to use that cliched expression. Therefore, you're better to stand back. However, there could be some criticism about adopting that approach because maybe to take the second example, you would be far better off to take a synergy manager uh, approach. And the suggestion here is that there are some quick wins. Again, apologies for the cliche. Uh, so it's actually a lost opportunity on behalf of the company making the acquisition not to get a little bit involved in what's going on down at the, the child company level and perhaps take two of these companies and say, you go and purchase your IT together and get a better discount. So as you can see here on the diagram, they're saying there should be a little bit of you know, uh, lateral uh, cooperation between the different companies in the portfolio uh, to see if they can gain economies of scale or, or issues like that. And then the last one is possibly one where 
the company doing the acquisition would want to be very clear that they're not accidentally um, getting themselves involved in this type of a relationship. So a parental developer is possibly one of the most ambitious, one that could end up with the highest amount of reward, but it's also the one that would have the most potential uh, problems. Because with a parental developer, you are not going to be able, as a corporate parent, to sit back like a portfolio manager and just review reports and give the child company uh, very broad uh, financial targets uh, that they must uh, strive towards. Uh, it's also not a case of doing the simple kind of quick wins that a synergy manager um, would be required to do, uh, you know, the old cliche of 2 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, the parental developer is going to have to really get stuck in and, and really help uh, to change the operations and the uh, resources and capabilities and competencies, etc., etc., of that particular business. So in any of these particular scenarios, the parent company can add value, but they can also destroy value. And one of the most fundamental ways that they will do that is by perhaps adopting the wrong approach. So the portfolio manager, you know, who should be really uh, getting involved in some very, very easy and profitable synergies doesn't add value because they adopt the wrong approach. Uh, or the person who believes that they're entering into a synergy manager uh, acquisition only to discover that the company that they've acquired is in severe distress, really needs an awful lot of help, so it actually needs a parental developer acquisition, but they're not equipped to do that. Uh, for some reason, their analysis failed to identify that what was required here was a company to come in and make an acquisition from a parental developer point of view and not a simple synergy manager. And by failing to recognize that, they failed to identify in advance that they're not capable uh, of adopting that type of a, of a relationship. So that's the idea. To conclude, it's basically about the fact that a parent company um, when engaging in an acquisition or when maybe engaging in a merger, but there will be one of the entities in the new merged uh, company is kind of more powerful, can, through its approach, <coughs> through its kind of its almost ideological attitude toward the acquired company, add or destroy uh, value. And that, that's the critical thing. You know, we must ensure that the, the choice that the company making the acquisition um, is doing I is correct. Um, and effectively, that's what you're going to see in both of these uh, questions, whereby uh, the company making the acquisition perhaps hasn't fully analysed uh, the nature of the acquisition, and on that basis, then they end up getting in themselves into awful uh, trouble. This slide sets out the actions that will be required by a company making an acquisition, or as I previously explained, uh, a merger of a particular type, in order for them to add value. Now, what you can see here is that it is theoretically possible for a portfolio manager to add value, for a synergy manager to add value, or a parental developer to add value. So you might be tempted to say, well, it doesn't matter really, you know, you're going to add value anyway. Well, you're not, because you mightn't have the skills. So, for example, if you make an acquisition based on the assumption that you're going to be able to adopt a very hands-off portfolio manager, role, only to find out that the company that you've made the acquisition of will go for the other extreme, is actually a parental developer relationship, well suddenly now you're going to find that rather than just setting disciplinary expectations, providing investment, uh, so again, you know, that's the simplest way you can add value, uh, the company's a little bit of financial distress, they're having difficulty securing financing, and you can come in and provide that, or indeed monitoring performance. You suddenly then find out that once you've, again, pardon the cliche, once you've looked under the bonnet at the engine, that this company needs enormous help with developing its strategic intent and mission, its external image, um, it needs specialist expertise in certain areas, uh, it needs to make dramatic improvements to its business and performance, and it needs its, its strategy to be developed properly and the existing assumptions within the business to be challenged. And discovering that, the company that make the acquisition might then come to the realization that they don't have the skill set to do this. They don't have the experience to do this. And the reason they found themselves in this terrible situation is not necessarily through arrogance, although that can be the case, um, you know, that they thought they could be a parental developer. Very often, it's because they fail to recognize 
that in actual fact this acquisition what was going to be a parental developer acquisition. So again as we see with both of the past paper questions in actual fact have, have kind of addressed this issue is the importance of the company making the acquisition to realize what they're getting themselves involved in and then hopefully being honest with themselves about what will be required. Um, so the other way that it could manifest itself and, and potentially let's say backfire is that they do correctly identify that it's not a portfolio manager relationship, that it is in fact a synergy, not a, not a synergy manager one either, pardon me. It is a parental developer acquisition, but that they haven't perhaps been honest or, or humble about their own skills. And they have overestimated or overvalued uh, their own ability uh, to do the tasks that are required and laid out here in the table of a parental developer. So that's really the way that the P3 syllabus wants to address this type of, of uh, topic. And to very briefly uh, try and contextualize it, and the rest of the presentation will go through this as you go through the, the MMI question from December 2008, you will discover that what basically happened was um, the MMI company um, successfully executed uh, an acquisition. Uh, they did that clearly with the intention of being a portfolio manager. And they stumbled completely by accident on synergies. Now, this for some reason led them uh, to come to the conclusion that they were not only synergy managers, and again to emphasize the narrative shows you that the synergy manager dynamic was completely accidental. Uh, their, their initial rationale for the acquisition was purely a portfolio manager and they stumbled by absolute fluke on some synergies. Uh, this led to kind of a little bit of arrogance and overconfidence and unfortunately it was amplified because they then even went a stage further. So having intended to be a portfolio manager, they stumbled on a synergy, so convinced themselves they were synergy managers and then somehow decided that that meant that they were also able to be a parental developer. Um, and what you're going to see is that the next acquisition they made ended up being a complete disaster. And the reason for that is that, you know, they weren't parental developers. They had no experience or expertise in that regard. They weren't even synergy managers because the synergies that they had managed to exploit out of their first acquisition were completely by fluke. And then it's leading to an absolutely almost apocalyptic scenario where in question 2C of the December 08 uh, question, sorry, question 2B, they're considering in buying another highly distressed company. And really what they're doing is they're massively overestimating uh, their own ability. So the way that the question can manifest itself in relation to this topic is as per those two, or indeed another way it could be uh, asked is as per this slide, is having correctly identified the nature of your relationship as a a company making an acquisition, what then would be expected of you? So the question could be phrased differently as in, you know, we're actually telling you um, that this acquisition is being viewed as a synergy manager acquisition. And what you're now being required to do is advise the company on what their um, tasks and responsibilities will be in that context. And again, what your job then would be to say, well, they're going to be required to develop the company's mission, uh, make sure they have clarity about their image, develop certain strategic capabilities, achieving synergies, um, etc. So that's the, the way that the, the question we think can manifest itself. We've seen two past paper questions of a, of a similar style. And then the, the other possible way it could be asked is, having told you um, what type of uh, relationship will, will, will uh, be happening as a result of the acquisition, how then should the company proceed and advise them, that might be the verb, advise them on um, what tasks uh, will be required post-acquisition. As with all questions in P3, your first task is to apply my suggested exam technique. To reacquaint yourself with the exam technique, you'll find it on pages 3 to 6 of the course notes. So going through the steps, starting at step 1, the first thing to consider is the marking scheme. As with most questions, you'll find that this is assisted when you look also at step three. So as you can see from the circled items on this particular slide, we identify that there's actually two verbs separated by an and. So therefore, we know the question is in two parts. 
In terms of the marking scheme, your next thing to figure out is how many of the 15 are going for the explanation and how many for the assessment. You should take an opportunity to visit the ACCA website at some stage and look at the uh, examiner's interview from Steve Skidmore. Uh, there's an MP3 of the interview and also a transcript and he does explain in that interview that unlike other examiners, he does not differentiate in terms of cognition between two verbs. So when he separates of verbs in a question with the word and, he's applying equal marks to both. Therefore, you might be asking yourself the question, well, how do you divide 15 evenly? Uh, you can't do that. Uh, what you should do is take a look at the marking scheme on page 208 of my course notes. And you'll see the way he has constructed it there. It's very, very fair. However, my suggestion to you for consistency is that you should always try and halve the mark. So in this case, it's impossible. So the closest you can go is 8, 7. You should spend 8 marks on the part of the question that you feel you're strongest on and 7 marks on the part of the question that you feel you're slightly less strong. In terms of step 2 of the exam technique, the question here does provide us with some of the vital words that we have to include in our answer to make sure that the examiner cannot criticise us for not applying our answer to the narrative. I've already mentioned step 3. For step 4, the real thing there is just to practice and make sure that when you are writing your answer, you try and uh, use words and expressions that are as business-like as possible. In terms of step 5, it doesn't apply in this answer because there are no professional marks um, available in this particular question. And also, step 6, which is vital, is you should also, also apply the suggested timing metric and make sure you try and stick to that in the exam. Steps 1 and 3 of the exam technique play particular importance in relation to this slide. The purpose of this slide is to demonstrate to you what your physical answer really should look like on the exam script. We already ascertained that there were two requirements to the question um, on the previous slide, but because we're also dealing with two companies, there are two parts within each company. So the first part for you is to uh, conduct an assessment of the rationale for the acquisition by MMI of the two companies, and then you should perform an assessment of the subsequent performance of the two companies post-acquisition. It might be a useful thing for you now, even at this stage, to just pause the presentation to read the narrative and can you see if you can identify, even at a very high level at this stage, maybe the reasons or the rationale for the acquisition by MMI of First Leisure and then Boatland and then an assessment of the subsequent performance. So that might be a useful exercise to do at this stage before you even go on to the next part of the presentation. Paragraph 1 of the narrative sets out some of the reasons why MMI have embarked on this particular strategy of acquisitions. One useful exam technique issue which I have highlighted in this slide is the use of transitions. You'll be aware from my uh, lectures that I uh, have spent a lot of time emphasizing uh, the use of transitions both in questions and indeed in your answers. Uh, so again, we have two perfect examples of them here the however, comma, and the furthermore, comma. And so these transitions are a way of highlighting to the reader, and in this case you as the student, uh, that there is an important piece of information coming after these transitions, and it's not the same as the previous information. Uh, you can adopt a similar approach when you are answering your questions in the exam and highlighting to the examiner and the corrector that you're giving different pieces of information. Uh, the piece of red text underlined is maybe where you could name drop uh, the expression that I used, uh, PESTEL. Uh, it's not in the examiner sample solution, uh, but what you could say here is that the reason that MMI are embarking on this particular strategy is because of macro environmental factors outside of their control and they've been forced to do this. Uh, so that's something that you could mention. Uh, you could also perhaps mention some other issues, including maybe the, the product life cycle. Um, it may be applicable more to the next paragraph, but you could basically say that the product that currently uh, MMI are involved in, which is, you know, acquiring an open cast minding, uh, that's at a decline phase, that it's, it's gone past maturity and it's in a decline phase, and that's the reason why they've uh, been forced to take this particular strategic action. Again, they're not in the examiner sample solution, either the product life cycle or PESTEL as mentioned. Uh, they could be useful, uh, you know, answers for theory papers. The one thing you have to keep remembering is they're very, very subjective. But once you populate your answer with points of information with the required amount of depth, you should score the marks appropriately. 
Moving on to the second paragraph here, we can see another consistent element of the exam technique that I've been emphasizing the whole way through the course, namely that of transitions. So we can see here that consequently, and this again is telling us, look, that you need to focus in on the element that is coming after this because it's been used to emphasize an important piece of information in the narrative. The other areas that you can see that I've circled here, for example, diversification. Now, as we've mentioned in class, and in relation to the technical article of uh, mergers, acquisitions, and managing SBUs, you will see that there is some concern about the whole area of diversification, particularly unrelated diversification. So again, without trying to confuse issues here, but within P3, there will be sometimes some very necessary overlap between models. As we know, one of the four ANSOF growth strategies that you can select as diversification. And again, going back to that technical article, you will see there is some very deep concern about unrelated diversification. And again, it would be maybe obvious here, or you would at least have a suspicion that a quarrying company who then subsequently makes an acquisition of a leisure park. So again, I suppose maybe that's a very UK uh, expression. So you maybe think of a theme park uh, that they would have in the USA, like Disney World, etc., or Thorpe Park they would have in the UK, roller coasters, uh, amusements, these types of uh, things. There doesn't appear to be, you know, much of a, a commonality between a quarrying company and a leisure park company. So this is something from the very beginning that maybe should, you know, sound kind of a, a note of caution for you uh, as you go forward through the rest of the question. The first part of paragraph three is rich with information that we can use in our answer, uh, particularly with regard to the rationale uh, behind the acquisition of First Leisure by MMI. The first thing, however, I want to draw your attention to is the uh, circled text initially criticized. This is another exam technique tip to watch out for, and it relates to the language that is used. So when negative language is used in the case, you have to be aware that you know that is an important issue that they're, they're raising, because very often in P3, your task is to help a company uh, where things are not going very well for them. Moving on to the uh, piece of text highlighted, um, which relates to the questioning uh, by certain analysts as to why MMI were acquiring uh, a company that was involved in, in leisure. Uh, that's just re-emphasizing the point from the previous slide, that this is an unrelated diversification. Again, what's the rationale for an unrelated diversification? Well, we can use the colloquial term of not putting your, all your eggs in one basket. And now we try and avoid colloquialisms in the exam, but it's an unrelated diversification, which is supposed to give you a more balanced portfolio. The second thing as well is there's a little hint here, although we get it more uh, obviously conveyed to us later on, that First Leisure are already a profitable leisure group. So when we take the Ashridge portfolio matrix into account, um, it's not that um, uh, First Leisure is some sort of a basket case company that's crying out uh, for a, a company to help it. Uh, so there isn't a huge amount of parenting opportunities here. You know, there's a lot, not a lot going wrong with First Leisure that needs to be addressed. And that's something that you can mention uh, in your answer. The second thing that's highlighted uh, is, is, is the aspect of the first level managers being let uh, to run the company by themselves. 
Now this is a direct reference, a very obvious reference uh, to the rationale for adding value, whereby the corporate parent can take three views. Uh, they can be a hands-off portfolio manager, they can be a synergy manager or a parental developer. And this is a clear indication that initially um, when MMI acquired First Leisure, they were very much a portfolio manager and were hands-off. Let uh, the managers at First Leisure get on with running the company. We then see at the bottom of this particular slide that there was a transition. And the transition wasn't based on the inspired idea. And again, that's another exam technique issue to follow out for. When they use very rich and, and you know verbose language like that, it's for a reason. It's to make it stand out. Um, and this is basically whereby they've moved from uh, being a hands-off portfolio manager to a synergy manager. Um, so MMI identified that there was uh, uh, resources that they were currently using which were underutilized and they could now use these in another one of their uh, businesses in, in, their, in their portfolio and add value. So they've moved from hands-off portfolio manager to a hands-on synergy manager. Um, you could make reference to the, you know, the concept of the Johnson Schools and Whittington economies of scope here, where, where Johnson Schools and Whittington talk about allocating resources to different parts of the business at different times. So we now have you know, quarries which have run out of minerals being used as leisure parks. And sometimes that's referred to as economies of scope, because now MMI have essentially two products. They have quarries which um, and, uh, deliver minerals which they can sell, and they have also quarries which are near exhaustion or closed, which can be turned into leisure parks. So they now have, from the one resource, their scope has increased and that they now have two products. The first part of this slide uh, could include, again, some name dropping of Pestel. Um, the key word here which would draw your attention to Pestel is the mention of government. So anytime you see government, that can equal the P of Pestel. Probably of more relevance really here though is the uh, text highlighted in red. Um, the development of the new parks has helped the first leisure to expand considerably. So, you know, that's what I have referred to in class as a type one piece of information. Um, the examiner is telling you that in black and white and you don't really need to do anything with that information except give it back to them uh, under the correct heading. So this would not be, you know, the rationale for the expansion or the uh, acquisition, and uh, this is, as, you know, the result, this is what has happened post-acquisition, acquisition, that First Leisure has managed to expand. Um, the second uh, piece of text that's highlighted after Table 1 is, again, a second chance, in case you missed it the first time, which we, we addressed in the previous slide, that MMI are adopting a very much, uh, initially, a, a, a portfolio manager um, view it says here that they were the first leisure has continued to be run by the managers when MMI acquired the company, and MMI plays very little role in the day-to-day -day running of the company. So you know we're, we're we're getting a sense again that you know they provided some some synergy, and then they they went away. So they're not um, you know a, a parental developer where they're they're constantly on site, constantly you know mentoring and um, assisting and helping MMI. They've gone in, provided the resource which has been underutilized in MMI, given it the first leisure, created the synergy, and they've gone away. So it's showing here that you know they are involved in managing synergy, but they're not having to get down to a parental um, uh, developer level. The other thing which I've circled in this slide, which is very important, and uh, many of you might think this is glaringly obvious, but again, this has been the subject of some highly negative comment in the examiner's report, is the C table one. Um, the examiner has been very critical of people not using the quantitative data that he has taken the time and effort to put into the narrative. And uh, this is kind of like a big hint, you know, I don't know how obvious he's going to get with this is, you know, I think the next thing he's going to draw an arrow um, from the text uh, over to the, the financial data because students still seem to be ignoring this. And again, the figures you're going to be looking for here is the first leisure figures um, and, you know, the expansion. And you'd actually have to try and measure that. And again, that's going to go, go into the second part of your answer about first leisure, about how they got on post acquisition. Um, which is, uh, you know, a, a very, very good point, and you would gain easy uh, marks for including that in your answer. At first glance, paragraph four actually looks like a little bit of a red herring, and um, we're concentrating on on question two a, and we would be asking ourselves, what has the fact that MMI 
uh, acquired um, two uh, quarrying companies and a further five mines got to do with their um, acquisition of First Leisure and Boatland. Well, there is a very valid point here, and albeit it's, it's very subtly made in, in this paragraph. What the examiner is trying to see uh, that you may or may not identify here, the challenge for the student is, MMI have been successful in acquiring an unrelated company, First Leisure. However, First Leisure, although they were unrelated, they were performing well. In this case, MMI have acquired a related company who were underperforming. And in this case, they, they took a very much a parental developer role, went into these two underperforming companies and turned them around. But what now MMI have done is they've convinced themselves that because they bought an unrelated company who was performing, and then a related company who wasn't performing, that they can do uh, what they try to do with Boatland, which was an unrelated underperforming company. Now it sounds almost like a bit of a tongue twister, but basically what they've done is they've, they've you know, nearly, you could say, cross-multiplied an equation to suit themselves. So just to highlight again, First Leisure was unrelated, but there wasn't any problems. These two mining companies were related, but there uh, was problems. So just because you buy a related company that's underperforming and you've already bought an unrelated company that was performing doesn't mean you are in a position to buy an unrelated underperforming company and expect to turn it around. You haven't built up that experience yet. So the statement here by the CEO that MMI have now a corporate management capability um, which they can you know, impose on other organisations. It's a little bit premature and as we'll see with the Boatland example, it didn't work out because Boatland was a, a different scenario. It wasn't first leisure, unrelated but no problems. It's not these two mines which were related and problems that, that MMI had a vast amount of experience that they could fix. Boatland was an unrelated uh, company with problems and MMI had no track record of, of solving that kind of a, a situation. There are some great examples of type 1 uh, information in this particular part of paragraph 5. This is the type of information where the examiner gives it to you in black and white and all you have to do is give it back and uh, put it underneath the correct heading. So for starters we're moving on to the second section of our answer. We're now dealing with both land we've left um, first leisure behind us. And in the first part here, you can see in the highlighted red text, uh, they're just emphasizing again that this is an unrelated um, a, a diversification. Um, however, you know, a, a great thing for you here, and it would be important you would spot this, you know, he even uses the word rationale. So like, you know, the first part of the question is explain the rationale. He's told you here, so you just have to give that back under the appropriate heading. So in this case, whereas first leisure was uh, an effort at diversification, uh, and the initial rationale behind it was a portfolio manager where they were using the cash from their quarries uh, to get into another business that would be around when the quarries would run out of their resource. This was very much aimed at synergy, um, you know, and this was uh, supposed to dovetail um, with uh, the, the uh, purchase of First Leisure. So they bought First Leisure with cash from their quarries so that they wouldn't have to rely on quarries in the future but they're buying Boatland specifically to help First Leisure. So there is a, a different motivation here. The rationale is different. The purchase of um, First Leisure was not to help the mines. Now, it ended up that the mines uh, helped First Leisure, particularly the inactive mines, but that wasn't the initial rationale. The rationale from the very beginning and the whole reason why MMI purchased uh, Boatland was so that they could help um, first Leisure. So just to reiterate that again, the rationale behind purchasing First Leisure was not to help uh, MMI's mining business, although the mining business uh, sometime after the initial uh, purchase was able to help First Leisure. In this case, the purchase of Boatland was mainly driven because of how they could help First Leisure and maybe how First Leisure could help them. So it explains here that First Leisure had a problem in terms of uh, obtaining and maintaining boats for its leisure parks and that Boatland would, would help them out in this regard. And straight away we can see, you know, the, the rationale behind it was cost savings 
and it also was allowing Boatland to expand its production. So really, you know, on, on the basis of the first part of this paragraph 5, we have three or possibly four points of information which we can develop about the rationale behind the acquisition of Boatland. Now what we're going to go on to now uh, shortly is what happened post-acquisition and uh, this wasn't uh, as happy a story as the experience with First Leisure. Paragraph 5 gives us a glimpse into how the acquisition of Boatland by MNI uh, has fared out. As you can see, they've taken quite a hands-on role where they've actually replaced the Boatland management with their own management personnel, but we can now see that perhaps they have fallen into the ultimate trap of the corporate payers, is rather than adding value, they've actually destroyed value. Again, from an exam technique point of view, you can see the use of a transition here, this time it's, it's qualifying what happened. Um, however, Boatland was reporting poorer results, so you know they've made things worse rather than better. You can also see some reference here, not that it would be necessary, but it is useful uh, to perhaps the marketing mix, and so they're no longer making um, products that the majority of the customers of Boatland are interested in, you know, and maybe they're concentrating on a very small niche, which is the products that First Leisure want. And so you can see that there's a, a, an issue here. Um, and, you know, you can also see that uh, as a result of the um, decision they've taken, and we just read the quote, uh, First Leisure were for casual use of holidaymakers who often ill-treated them and certainly had no long-term investment um, in their ownership. So again, really what has happened here is MMI have got this badly wrong and rather than adding value as a, as a corporate parent, what they've actually uh, managed to do is destroy a little bit of value that was there. So a different corporate parent who was more skillful and more appropriate perhaps could have made the acquisition of Boatland and they would have been successful because they would have been equipped to do so. It's quite clear that MMI are not equipped to do so. The last part of paragraph 5 really is, you know, rich with uh, type 1 information which we can include in our answer. And you'll probably have noticed as we're coming to the, you know, the end of the, the uh, narrative that really answering the question in terms of Boatland was probably an awful lot easier than First Leisure. You know, the examiner told us in black and white why uh, Boatland was purchased and he's telling us in black and white what happened after they were purchased. Um, so the first leisure acquisition, um, the rationale and the post acquisition performance uh, there might have been more challenging, but really in relation to Boatland, it was very clearly stated. And as I've said to you before in class, you can expect that kind of an approach both within questions and within a, a, a section. Some parts will be expected the students will score very well, other parts will be more challenging. So again, just look at the three uh, words highlighted uh, in, in the first part of the slide here, complained, too delicate, unreliable. So, you know, with, with language like that, it should be quite obvious what way you're going to assess um, the, the post-acquisition uh, performance um, of Boatland. Um, again, you could make you know further reference. I uh, mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, obviously, the, the use of the word customer here. Uh, you could use the marketing mix um, because they're obviously not giving the customer what they want. And then it tells us about further problems. Just look at the language again. These delays were compounded. Um, so it's telling us that you know post acquisition, this this was not good for for everybody. It was poor for Boatland, and it was poor for First Leisure. The last part of this slide is, is where we have a definite reference to the cultural web if you wanted to use it in your answer. It's not in the examiner's sample solution, so it's not a requirement, but it is something potentially that you could use. And there's fairly explicit reference made to it where basically as a result of the acquisition, rather than synergies which never developed, um, we've, we've actually damaged Boatland because over half of the uh, the, you know, the, the, the boat builders or almost half of the boat builders have left the company 
Um, so we've totally failed in this example in adding any kind of value uh, to either organization or any synergies. And in fact, we've, we've damaged Boatland and First Leisure still aren't getting their problems solved. Paragraph 6 very much focuses on the requirement of question 2B uh, rather than question 2A. And that's the whole area of whether um, MMI um, should proceed with the acquisition of Infotech. However, there is one element here which perhaps you can use uh, backwards, if I can use that expression, into 2A. And that's the fact that after its experience with Boatland, the CEO of MMI is cautious. So that's suggesting you know, that what happened with Boatland w w was not positive. And um, as a, a corporate parent, um, it would appear that their experience in this regard has not always been successful. And again, it goes back to the theme I mentioned earlier. You know, they made an acquisition of First Leisure because they basically had, had more cash than they knew what, what, what to do with. They stumbled on synergies, got a little bit maybe cocky and arrogant, uh, then went and uh, made an acquisition of Boatland. And as it turned out here, now maybe they've only realized that they're not the fantastic corporate parent that they thought they were. So in that context, then, they would be maybe very cautious about going to the next stage, which is actually into a, what we would hope is an obvious parental developer a situation, because Infotech quite clearly is a company in distress. Uh, but the, the hint here in relation, going back to 2A, is you know, never mind considering going down the road of being a parental developer. You know, you know what you're letting yourself in for, um, but it's quite obvious. But you haven't even demonstrated that you're good at being a synergy manager because you thought that's the relationship you were getting into with Boatland, and it turned out that it wasn't or that you weren't uh, equipped to do that. There are four sections to the quantitative data in this case study. Your first temptation when concentrating on answering question 2A would be to concentrate on the data relating to Boatland and First Leisure only. However, there is some useful information in, in relation to the data about the MMI business itself, the quarrying business, which could help explain the rationale for the pursuit of the acquisition of the other two companies. The very first thing, however, to remember when analyzing financial data is that you mustn't jump straight in. You should scan the data first, uh, see what information maybe is worth investigating that you can use in your answer, and then that's when you start calculating uh, percentage increases and ratios and that kind of uh, processed information. So when we look at this, we see one very obvious thing, and this was mentioned in the narrative, and the figures have subsequently proved this, which is that the quarrying and mining business is operating in a declining market. We can see from 02 to 08, the entire market has decreased from 6300 to 6015. So management sus suspicions or their concerns were proved right and that they were operating in a declining market. A model you could use to name drop here is the product life cycle. We mentioned this previously. So this particular product, uh, the mineral uh, in terms of the quarrying and mining business, has gone past maturity and it's now in the decline phase. And the second information that is relevant here is what I've referred to previously in class as type 2 information. So you haven't been given the information on the silver platter. You've been given two parts of the information which you must process, and that then will give you something valuable that you can include in your answer. And now I've get done all the calculations on the table below, but you maybe would just have to concentrate on some of them. You may not have the time to perform all the calculations. So what model can you apply and how is this relevant? Well, another thing you have to watch out for in case studies is if they provide you with information that is applicable to a model, the chances are they want you to use that model. So uh, particularly in this case, we were purposely given information on the size of the entire market and then the size of the market share that the particular company had. Well, they are the X and Y axis for the Boston box. And what we can see here is that the market share that MMI have of quarrying and mining as a market is increasing. So taking your x-axis on the Boston box, they're over on the left-hand side. The only problem is uh, what size is that market? Is it growing or is it shrinking? Now, even though it's only small, um, minus 1.5%, 2.5%, 0.5%, it is a market that's shrinking. So taking the y-axis on the Boston box, it's down at the bottom end. So if you plot that, if you are on the left axis on the left-hand side, and if you're at the bottom of the y-axis, you're a cash cow. And it also was mentioned in the case in a very obvious, you know, and in-your-face way, 
uh, where it specified the cash. It said the cash from the quarrying business was used to purchase First Leisure. So this is giving you a further clue that the quarrying and mining business was viewed as a cash cow. Uh, a cash cow is eventually going to become a dog. So what you have to do with a cash cow is when things are going well, use that cash uh, to support your question marks and your stars. And this is another vital thing that you should have included in your answer in, in this question. The quantitative information provided about first leisure provides the basis for a number of points in your answer. Uh, these points would be relating to the post-acquisition part of your answer. So basically your uh, analysis of what happened to first leisure after it was acquired by MMI. Again, as previously mentioned, the most important thing perhaps is to do a, a quick scan. And from a quick scan, you can see that there was good increase in results from 02 to 04, fantastic increases in results from 04 to 06, and then uh, reasonably good, maybe excellent uh, results in the 06 to 08 period, but not as good as the previous one. So why did that happen and how can you apply that to your answer and is there any theory you can use? Well, the answer to all that is yes. Clearly the reason why this happened and it was stated in the narrative is although MMI acquired First Leisure in 02, they considerably changed their attitude with regard to, M to First Leisure in 04. So in the 02 to 04 period they were very much a hands-off portfolio manager. And then from the 04 to 06 period when they decided that they could use their um, disused and exhausted mines to help First Leisure get additional leisure parks, they changed uh, their attitude and became a hands-on synergy manager. So this would be under the theoretical heading of the, the three rationales for adding value and that would explain the dramatic improvement. So there's at least two points of information and you could even develop those into three or four points of information in terms of your assessment of the performance of First Leisure post-acquisition by MMI. Uh, the second piece of information, uh, or, or basis for multiple pieces of information that's available on this slide, uh, is in relation to the size of the market and the market share that First Leisure uh, currently holds. As mentioned in the previous slide, this is type 2 information, so this is not handed to you on a silver platter uh, like the differences we've just discussed about the revenue, the gross profit and the net profit. You have to work this out. And again, because you have the, the two uh, basis of the X and Y axis in the Boston box, you have to use the Boston box in your answer. So uh, the two uh, axes you're talking about is the market share the first leisure has of the market and if that market is growing or not. And as we can see in this example, um, the market share that First Leisure has is growing. So taking the x-axis, they maybe would have started over on the right-hand side where they had a low uh, share of the market. They have now quite a substantial share of the market, like it, it's a fifth of the market. Uh, so that's going to place them on the left-hand side of the x-axis. In relation to the y-axis, we have to consider is this market actually uh, growing uh, or st static or shrinking? We can clearly see that the size of this market is actually growing. Uh, by 2008, it has increased uh, 12%. So on that basis, taking the y-axis, it's not at the bottom end of the y-axis, it's at the top end. So therefore, if you are plotting a company that is on the left-hand side of the x-axis and the top side of the y-axis, that clearly is a star. And that is something that you would have to include in your answer. Again, multiple points of information. It's post-acquisition, uh, uh, your assessment of it, and you are now classifying First Leisure uh, as a star business or a star product within the MMI corporation. The quantitative data with regard to Boatland also provides the basis for a number of points of information that you can include in your answer. Again, this would be in, in respect of the answer uh, about the post-acquisition performance of Boatland. So the first thing to determine is when did that acquisition happen. Again, the narrative tells it was 2006. And if you look at the figures, um, there was a dramatic difference in the 06 to 08 uh, performance of the company. The period from 02 to 04 and up to 06 uh, certainly wasn't fantastic, but it was an awful lot better than what happened after uh, Boatland was acquired by MMI. So you would have to include that in your answer about your assessment of Boatland post-acquisition by MMI. Uh, you could also bring in the theory here uh, about maybe why this happened. And the reason it happened is that MMI had incorrectly identified that they now had this fantastic strategic capability, uh, which was now a corporate asset uh, 
uh, of being able to turn around a company. Now we've gone through this before where uh, just because it worked with First Leisure which was an unrelated diversification but with, with a, a profitable company and just because it worked with the quarrying businesses which were related uh, but they did need uh, a performance to, uh, to be addressed by uh, helping management, it, it's not the same scenario here. This was um, unrelated and a company that maybe was struggling in any regard. So you would have to mention that. You could also mention in your answer here about the reason behind it initially was to give synergies between Boatland and First Leisure, um, but they weren't going in just as a synergy manager, they were going in as a parental developer to try and um, address the problems of the underperforming management team. The second model you can apply is in relation to the, uh, again, the type 2 information. It wasn't given to us on a silver platter. We had to figure out the size of the market uh, that Boatland is competing in and their market share. Again, this is clearly the X and Y axis on the Boston box, and if we plot that information, we see that the market share uh, that Boatland has on the X axis is very small, so they're way over over on the, uh, on the right hand side. In terms of the size of that market, is it growing or shrinking? Um, it, it's growing but by a tiny amount or in the last period it, it's not changing at all. So it's going to be in the bottom level of the Y axis. So if you plot a company that are on the bottom of the, the, y, the y axis, if they're way over on the right hand side of the X axis, they're a dog. And that's another uh, basis for multiple points of information in your answer. This slide provides a quick summary of the potential issues that you can turn into points of information for your answer for uh, the first leisure part of the question. Um, one thing to uh, emphasize here very strongly is there are far more potential issues which you could develop into points of information here than would be required to get maximum marks in the exam. There's 11 issues here and two of those issues denoted by the asterisk could provide multiple points of information. Um, so you must remember that. The second thing to stress is, as I mentioned before, I thought the first leisure uh, part of the question was more difficult and even within that part of the question the rationale for the acquisition by MMI is more difficult in the assessment of the subsequent performance. And uh, so the information for the assessment of the subsequent performance I think was more readily available. Uh, you need to watch out for this in the exam and maybe this was the intention of the examiner whereby he placed not only the most difficult part of the, the question uh, first, the most difficult part within that question first. And a lot of students may have become bogged down in trying to answer the part about the rationale for uh, the acquisition by MMI of first leisure, therefore uh, consuming time that they could have been spending on the subsequent parts of the question, which in my opinion were easier. So quickly going through them. It was clearly obvious that a major motivational factor behind acquiring uh, First Leisure was the declining market uh, that MMI was operating in. Um, they were having to diversify for reasons outside of their control and it was an unrelated diversification, uh, which is very often a good and prudent thing to do in business. So that they were their reasons. You could also say that reasons were uh, that they were concerned about the direction that the business was going in the future and the subsequent figures prove that. Uh, the initial plan was to adopt the hands-off approach. Remember, they were buying First Ledger, which was already a profitable business, and if they had left them alone, there was every good indication that they would continue to be profitable. So you would name drop the portfolio management role that they initially took under the three rationales for adding value. And uh, the last thing you can do here is you can even mention the Boston box here in the rationale uh, part of your answer because they were using the cash from their cash cow um, uh, to, to put into another business and that's what you're supposed to do. So that, that was another reason. More clearly available was the assessment of the subsequent performance. Uh, so uh, the business is already profitable. Um, and they were um, ad adopting a kind of a portfolio management role. But then there was this inspired idea, this verbose language that was used in the narrative, which is done for a reason to make the thing stand out for, for you, the student, to recognize. Um, and uh, we now had a situation where post-acquisition, uh, MMI moved from a hands-off portfolio management role to a synergy management role and the subsequent uh, improvement in performance on the basis of that. So that would be part of your assessment that initially First Leisure performed maybe the way it would have had uh, if MMI didn't acquire it and then suddenly um, it dramatically improved. So there were unexpected synergies, again you could name drop the Johnson Scholes and Whittington's allocation of resources here and then very very vitally you must have mentioned the Boston box. It gave you those two pieces of information uh, after the acquisition you had a situation where the business was now not only growing its market share, the market in which it was operating was also growing. 
Lastly would be the Ashridge portfolio matrix. This is probably a difficult one to spot, whereby initially when the acquisition took place, we've explained in the rationale why it happened, and it wasn't because they saw massive parenting opportunities that First Leisure was a basket case company. It wasn't because um, it was profitable, and it wasn't immediately obvious that there was anything that um, MMI could offer to First Leisure. In fact, they were they were going for an unrelated uh, company for that very reason, to, to, to not put all their eggs into one basket as such. Then things changed. Suddenly, First Leisure had a parenting opportunity and needed land, and MMI were able to provide that land. So they became a heartland business if you apply the Ashridge portfolio matrix. So there is a quick summary of the potential issues that you could develop at the points of information for your answer. Here's a summary of the potential points of information that you could include in your answer for boat land. In my opinion, this was an easier part of the question. There was far more obvious. Uh, information provided about the rationale for the acquisition and uh, information as to how you could assess the subsequent performance. The first thing uh, is the synergy. Um, without doubt, the motivation behind this acquisition was synergy. Uh, MMI was hoping that by acquiring Boatland, they could create synergies between Boatland and First Leisure. Uh, there was a belief on MMI's part that they had the competencies to enable these synergies because of their positive experience with First uh, Leisure and with the other mining companies they bought, they suddenly felt that they now had this corporate management capability to enable synergies. Uh, but as I explained earlier on in the presentation, that that was a flawed belief. Um, there was also the basic opportunity to correct an underperforming company, and a lot of companies would engage in this. They would, they would ascertain from a, an outside perspective that that company is underperforming because of poor management, and if they can solve the management, they can solve the, the company. Um, Another reason was obviously supply problems, which was uh, explicitly stated in the case that First Leisure were experiencing, and then the cost savings. Now, I've said name drop backward integration there, and you might say at this stage in the course we haven't covered backward integration. We haven't. And I will be summarizing um, the uh, concepts and models that I mentioned in slide four. This is quite a, a good example of a question, which is that one of the challenges in P3 is that questions in section A can span multiple chapters whereas questions in section B uh, may be very uh, locally contained to a particular topic. So as you saw on slide four, you could answer this question uh, using a number of topics from chapters one the whole way to, to, to chapter 10. Uh, it's not something to get disheartened about. There's far more information provided here uh, than you would need to get maximum marks. And if there were some particular concepts or theoretical models that you didn't mention that are on slide four, you could still score full marks for this question. So looking then at the assessment of the subsequent performance, you know, there was absolutely no diplomatic language used to disguise or soften the fact that this was a disaster. Uh, this uh, acquisition did not uh, prove to be successful. You had it in the narrative data, and you had it in the, in the quantitative data. You also had quite clearly um, you know, the information in the narrative about the rationale. It actually used the word rationale in the narrative and said, this is why um, Boatland was purchased by MMI. There's multiple points of information from the quantitative data. Um, it did more harm than good. I know it's a bit colloquial, uh, but maybe an exercise for you to say, how could you articulate that more professionally? They didn't have the corporate management capability that they thought they had uh, to enable the synergies here. Uh, so they really kind of overassessed their ability. Uh, you could definitely get at least two points of information on the Boston box uh, when you would plot the company. Um, this is Boatland. Uh, operating in a market that's not growing and with a very small segment, they're definitely classified as a dog. In terms of the Ashridge portfolio matrix, um, Boatland ended up being a value trap. Undoubtedly, there was a huge opportunity for parenting because the management were, were poor. So you know that management needed to be replaced. So there was an opportunity there for parenting. The only problem is MMI uh, didn't have the critical success factor uh, to offer that parenting that they thought they had. It subsequently proved that they didn't have that critical success factor, uh, and that's why really you would classify Boatland in that regard as a value trap. The last one is the cultural web. Again, I know it's a topic we haven't covered at this stage of the course, but when we do cover it, we will refer back to MMI, and you could see that as even another further uh, point of information you could have included in your answer. So when you add all these up here, considering that there are, are multiple points of information that can be made from, from three of the issues, you know there is an abundance uh, of points of information be using this answer, and in my opinion, this was easier than the first part. You will probably have noticed the whole way through the presentation that I have made reference to a number of the different uh, academic models that we've done in the course uh, so far. 
Now, the primary ones that refer to this question uh, directly are the three highlighted in red, the rationales for adding value, the BCG matrix, and then also the Ashridge portfolio display. Now, strictly speaking with this question, the 08 question, you actually didn't have to use any of these models whatsoever, never mind the three in red, or in particular the rationales for adding value. But the fact that rationale for adding value, or the word rationale was used in the question, was a, was a strong hint. In the 2010 question, however, you had to use the three rationales for adding value. It was explicitly stated, and maybe in a, in a moment of kindness, the examiner actually decided to include the three of them in the question. So he actually gave you portfolio manager, synergy manager, and parental developer. Uh, you wouldn't want to assume that that will be something that will always happen uh, with questions in this area. So I hope you found this presentation useful. Uh, it's more than just about the three rationales for adding value. However, that is an important topic. Uh, but it's also to show you about some of the, the choice questions, if we can just focus in on that. That particular part of the syllabus is very often the only way that you can review a choice or advise a choice or analyze a choice or criticize a choice or assess a choice is by doing um, some uh, analysis. And the, the reason or the rationale behind uh, the acquisitions that are covered in 2A, we can understand those from the narrative. And then what we would do is um, go through perhaps some of the models that are outlined here and make a determination if we think that that choice has been successful or not based on the subsequent performance. And so we know that you know some of the drivers behind the choice were, were Pestel and product life cycle issues. Uh, we would feel that some of the reason why we would criticize the choice based on the subsequent performance is because let's say the marketing mix, Bokeland wasn't producing both for the majority of its customers, or we might talk about strategic capability, MMI didn't actually have the capability uh, to, to do uh, what they thought they, they were going to do. So this is the idea behind a particular question like this. Again, I think when you break it down into the four different requirements, and um, they were of a slightly different standard, but I think a, a reasonably well-prepared student you know, should be scoring quite well um, on a question like this. And again, just to reiterate again, please don't let this list uh, frighten you. It's just something to show you that if you're reasonably on top of your theory, you might have seen some of these or hints towards these as you were going through the narrative. You didn't need to. Um, the core ones are the three highlighted in red. And even within that, the most important one is obviously the rationales for adding value.